In this video, we're going to take a look at how to set up VS Code to do remote development. Uh, and to understand why we would want to do this, I'm looking at the general information page for remote development in VS Code, and they have a, a bulleted list of the pros of um, why you might want to do this. Uh, but long story short, what we can do with this is we can use some remote server as like a development server. In other words, a place where we work on our applications while they're in progress before we're ready to uh, deploy them to like our production server. All right, and this is uh, in contrast to how we might have done things previously where maybe we were running the server locally on our computer, we're managing all of that software. Instead of doing that, we could do it on a remote server. And there's lots of benefits we can see from that. Um, and they do a good job uh, here outlining those benefits. So that's just some quick background of the why. Let's dig into the how. Uh, and when it comes to, to doing this, there, you have a few different options with how you can do your remote development. Uh, and to see those options, I'm going to switch over to VS Code. Let me pull up the extensions. And I'm going to search for remote dev. And you can see that there's uh, this kind of main extension here. This is a, an extension pack. This contains three separate extensions uh, that each represent the different ways you can do remote development. Um, so extension one is remote SSH. This will allow you to create a remote connection just using the SSH protocol. And that's actually the example I'm going to show in this video. Another option is remote WSL. Uh, this is something you can do if you want to use the Windows subsystem for Linux. If you're on a Windows-based operating machine, you could use that. And then finally, the third option is uh, if you're working with like Docker containers and you want to remotely connect to them, you can use this particular extension. Uh, but like I said, in this example, I'm just going to show you kind of the most basic one, which is just making a remote connection via SSH. So the first step to this is getting this extension installed. I mean, you can install the entire pack and get all three. Uh, but for this example, we really just need the remote SSH. So uh, pull that up. And uh, I've already got it installed on my end. On your end, you would just click the install button and get that installed. And then once it's installed, just take note at the very bottom left is the little remote uh, connection icon. It's this, these little double um, uh, angle brackets, I guess you would say. And if you click that, it'll give you some options of things that you can do. Um, before we get into that, though, we need to talk about the server that we're actually going to be connecting to. Uh, and for this example, what I'm going to do is actually just create a brand new server that we can connect to. Um, if you want to follow along, I'm going to be creating this server on DigitalOcean. It's just one of many hosting providers out there. I'm going to create what's called a virtual private server. Uh, and the way I'm going to do it, I'm already logged into DigitalOcean. So I'm just going to say create. And they call their uh, servers droplets. So I'm going to choose droplet. And then from the options here, I'm going to go over to marketplace. I'm going to search for LEMP. Um, I'm just choosing the software I want on this server. Um, it's going to be set up with the LEMP stack. So that's going to be Linux. Nginx, MySQL, and PHP. Um, but really, any server would work for remote development. It doesn't have to be this particular stack. That's just the one I'm going to use in this example. Uh, then I do have to go through and select a plan. So this is just a very basic demo. I'll be destroying this after this example. So I'm just going to make it the cheapest plan that they have, 5 bucks a month. And then skimming through these other options, I'm just going to leave everything as the default. Um, I am going to set it up with SSH keys. That way I will be able to connect to the server without having to enter a password. Um, whether you, you, if you're following along, whether you use SSH keys, if you have them, you could use them here. Uh, or you could just um, set it up with a password and then you can connect using that password. Uh, but in my case, I am going to use my existing SSH keys. Um, and then again, leave everything as the default. If you want to give it a um, an alias name, you can do that. So I'll just say my server. And then we're just looking for the, the green button at the bottom to create this droplet. Um, and this will provision a new server instance for us. So I'll give this a few moments to finish and I'll wait for it to give me uh, my IP address for this server. All right, excellent. That's all done. Here's the IP address. So if I want to pull this up in the browser, Give it a second, it might have not quite propagated yet. Let me refresh that. There we go. All right, so this is just the default splash page that every new LEMP server um, on DigitalOcean comes with. The other thing that I want to test is just that I can uh, make an SSH connection to the server. So back in VS Code in my terminal pane, let's attempt to connect. So I'm going to say SSH. Um, all of these servers are always set up with the default user called root. So we'll connect as that user, and I'll paste in my IP address. And perfect. So I was able to successfully log in. Didn't have to enter a password because I was using SSH keys. Um, so depending on how you set things up, um, it might prompt for a, pants, a password. 
All right, so now that I know that I can um, establish an SSH connection with the server, we want to use the remote development extension to make that connection. So coming down to the remote dev icon, let's click that. And we want to open up our SSH configuration file. Um, I could go directly to connect to host and, and give it the information there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my host information in the configuration file just so that anytime I want to reconnect to the server, that configuration will be saved for me. All right, so we're going to open that configuration file and then choose the first option it gives you. That is probably the main SSH um, config file on your system. So that's the one you want to use. So I'm going to choose that. And then uh, if you've ever worked in this file before, you might have some existing configs, um, as you can see I, I do in my case, um, in which case what I'm about to have you add, you just want to add at the end of the file. If you've never worked with this config file before, this might be an empty file and that's fine. Just add it at the top of the file. All right, now here's what we're going to add here. I'm actually going to jump over to the notes so I can grab the configurations for this. So skimming down or setting up a new connection, here's what we're looking for. All right, so this is a host block that we're going to add to this config file. So I'm going to copy that and bring that in there. And then um, I'm going to uh, change it for, for my connection here. So the first thing I need to do is come up with an alias for this. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it as the default on my server. Um, you can change this as you see fit for your needs. Next, we need the host name. This is just going to be the IP address that we want to connect to. So let me go back and just copy that from my browser. Uh, then the user, and again, right now I'm just connecting as the root user. Ultimately, if this was a server I was going to continue to work with, I'd want to create a different user and, and not always access as the root user just because it has admin privileges. There's some dangers involved with that. But for this example, I'm just going to leave it as is. Next up, I have two settings that are going to determine um, basically how the connection is going to be maintained with the server. Um, and this is something I'll talk a little bit towards the end. There's some optimizations um, tips I have in, in regards to doing remote development, and it relates to this. So we can come back to that. But for now, just leave this as part of the block that I give you. You don't have to change anything here. All right, so save your changes. And then coming back to the remote dev icon again, we're going to click that. And this time we're going to say connect to host. And we should see that server that we just defined in our config there. So click that. And it should pop open a new VS Code window. And the very first time you connect to the server with this extension, you'll see it'll go through like a setup process. And what it's doing there is it's actually installing a VS Code server on your server. And that's what really powers the whole remote development um, process. All right, so now that I'm connected, this window right here uh, this is all dialed into my server, right? So anything I'm doing here is actually happening on the server. For example, down here in the terminal window, this prompt, this is the prompt on the server. And if I run a command like list to show the um, directory contents of where I currently am, that is not files or folders that's on my computer. This is on the remote server. Similarly, with my file explorer, I can start to work with files on my server here. So let's say open folder. And uh, on this particular server, the document root um, is located at uh, within our var directory. So I'll start there, go in the var directory. Then there's a www, direct, uh, www directory. I'm going to open that. Uh, and I'll go ahead and just open that just so we can see that parent directory. All right, so you can see that now it's open here on the left. And within there, we have a single folder called HTML. And then within there, that's actually where our default splash page is set. All right, so this HTML folder inside of var www, that's our document root on the server by default. Uh, and of course, depending on the server that you're working with, all of these things are going to vary. Um, but if you're following along with this example, that's where you'll find the default document root. All right, so here's that uh, index file. That um, file is uh, what we're seeing here, this content here. And just to show that and to make our first edit using this extension, what we're going to do is I'm just going to clear all of that out and just put in a basic HTML template and just put some content there. So I'll say my server example, and I'll throw that in an H1 on the body of the page as well. All right, so now when I save these changes, and I'm just using my keyboard shortcut for that, um, that's automatically going to make that change happen on the server. So now coming back to the server, if I refresh it, I can see the changes there. All right, and with that, you can see what your development experience would look like. Uh, you would just work in VS Code like you would usually. The difference is, is just that any of the things you're doing are happening on that remote development server.
Now, with all of that set up, uh, before we conclude, though, there's a few optimizations I want to talk about. Um, the first is just some initial configurations. Um, you'll note that if you're using something like a theme in VS Code, you won't see that automatically when you connect to the remote server. Uh, and you can even see that here. So here's my remote dev window, and it has the default VS Code theme, this like gray background. Whereas this uh, other window I have here that's just on my local computer, this is using a different theme. Um, and the reason that happens is because when we first set up this connection, not all of the extensions we have in VS Code are going to automatically be installed on the remote server. Some of them we have to uh, explicitly install. To show what I mean, let's bring up our extensions. And if you scroll through your list of installed extensions, um, you'll see that some of them are grayed out. These are the ones that were not automatically installed on your remote server. So if these are extensions that you want to use on that server, all you have to do is just click the little install button next to them. Um, and just to demonstrate this, I'm going to find my theme. Uh, it's this one right here, Pop and Lock. So you can see it wasn't installed. So I'm just going to go ahead and install it. Give it a second. It's going to set that up on the server. And then when it's done, it should update my theme. And there you go. All right, so that's one thing you'll want to do anytime you establish a new connection to a server is just go through and check what extensions were not automatically deployed there and make sure that they're set up. Now, just a word of caution, if you use a lot of extensions, um, I wouldn't just go and install every single extension because the more extensions you're using, the more it can sometimes bog down the remote development experience. So just be a little selective there and keep in mind that you can always add extensions later. Um, so if you find that you're missing something that you're used to working with in VS Code, you can always come back and install it. Another footnote is a couple of optimizations and things that you can do to make the remote development process uh, run smoother. Uh, the first is a setting within your um, remote dev extension that you can make. So let me pull up my settings to show you. I'm going to go into preferences and settings. And I'm going to so, uh, search for remote.ssh. And I want to find this setting right here for connect timeout. By default, it's going to be set to 15 seconds. I recommend upping that to 60 seconds. Now, what this setting is doing is it's specifying basically how long it should wait when it's attempting to establish a connection with your remote server. Um, and ideally, that, that should happen within 15 seconds. But from my experience in using this extension and then working with students using this extension, sometimes if you have a slow internet connection, um, it might take longer than those 15 seconds. And when it does, it kind of gets stuck in this loop of continually trying to reconnect, but not having enough time to reconnect and then trying to reconnect, so on and so forth. So to ease that, I just recommend upping this to 60 seconds. Um, similarly, if we go back to our uh, SSH config settings, so I'm going to click the remote dev icon on the bottom left again, go to open SSH config file, open that config file. Um, I want to highlight these two lines here, server alive interval and server alive count max. What this is going to do is it's going to help maintain your connection to the server uh, so that as you're working and as you're, you're you're making changes, you're saving files, opening files or whatever, it doesn't have to reconnect behind the scenes to the server every time because it's going to maintain that connection for you. Um, basically every 60 seconds, if you haven't done anything, it's going to like send a ping to the server to keep that connection alive. All right, so that's another thing that I've just found. It makes the process run smoother um, between that and the connection timeout setting. Now, the final recommendation I have is if you're trying to do remote development on a budget server, in other words, a server without a lot of resources, maybe it's got limited RAM, um, I've found that that doesn't always go so well um, because running the VS Code server can be a little um, resource intensive. So if that's the case, if you're running on a budget server, like a really cheap server with low RAM, and you're running into problems where it's timing out, um, it's, it's not connecting, things like that, what I recommend trying is enabling something called a swap file. And what a swap file will do is it'll basically use the hard drive space on your server as a backup if it runs out of RAM memory. All right, so that's just like a fail safe. Um, otherwise, if you don't do that, what I've found with some budget servers is it'll just lock up because it'll run out of memory and then VS Code will get in this loop because it'll constantly try to reconnect, but it can't reconnect because it's run out of memory. And um, oftentimes when that happens, the the only thing you can do to resolve it is actually restarting the server. Uh, so that that's really bogs down the whole experience. So uh, I definitely recommend if, like I said, you're working on a budget server, check out something called the swap file. Look into setting that up. That can make the process go smoother.
And then my final footnote or suggestion in regards to this remote development process is just keeping in mind that when you're doing development remotely on a server like this, um, this information or this this work is going to be publicly available, right? By default, this is a publicly available server. It's different than if you're just doing local development on your own computer where the rest of the world can't see it. Uh, so very typically, if you're, if you're using this process, what you want to do is set up some sort of restrictions. Uh, for example, you could do like a basic HTTP auth password that would make it so that anybody that's trying to access the server in the browser would have to enter um, some credentials to be able to, to see the work. Um, and that would be something that, you know, you would have access to, you could share with colleagues, clients, that sort of thing, but the general public wouldn't be able to see your work in progress. And with that, that's my last tip uh, in regards to using this particular extension. I hope you found this useful. Uh, I can see a lot of development moving towards this remote approach in the future. So uh, it's always interesting to look at tools like this.